Hi everyone, Dom Femilaro back again, Artist Series at a Distance, and this just keeps on getting better and better and better. I am so honored. Jim Pilser, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. What a wonderful opportunity. And you know, Jim, I must let everyone know that as a percussionist, a drummer, and a background vocalist with the Cry and Shames, you really were involved for many, many years in the music industry at such a deep level. So I want to kind of go back to the early stages of you being involved with music and getting involved with percussion. How did that all start for you? When I was a little kid, my mom would, you know, tie a uh, Quaker oats boxes together and make bongos for me and I'd be banging away and see I was born with one arm so you know and I had way too much energy as most drummers do I think (laughs) next thing I know I'm in college and I'm sitting in my windowsill with a pair of bongos listening to Bob Dylan records which all the guys in (laughs) In, in the whole uh, quad, hated Bob Dylan. I, they stole my album once and, <laughs> and broke it. <laughs> but, but I'd sit in the window with my bongos and I'd play and you could hear it echo all the way around. They'd finally find my room and they'd yell at me. And, you know, and uh, then I'm seeing a band called The Travelers. I couldn't help myself and I'm up on stage banging on a tambourine with them. And they let me. Who who would have guessed? You know, I didn't really play anything. And then they invited me to come back, uh, you know, again. And then we played two or three sock hops. And next thing I know, my mom is, I said, my arm is getting sore from banging the tambourine on it. So she takes a dowel rod and she cuts it, you know, on an angle, screws in a hook at the end of it, makes me a little sheath. And I put it on my end and it helped, you know, and. Next, and then we got a disc jockey from one of the, the big stations in Chicago calls us and says, I saw this band. The, are you the guys with the guy with the hook? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah. He said, well, I want you to play one of my sock ops. This is Dex Card. And this is in Chicago now. And, you know, just after the Beatles. And this guy introduced us to the guys that ended up being our managers. And uh, they let me join them. You know, what can I say? You know, I, I really, all I had was energy and, and I could carry a rhythm and dance and play tambourine. And me and the lead singer got into sticks together where we'd go hopping across the stage, throwing microphones and tambourines back and forth. And all the players were exceptionally good. Next thing I know, we're doing albums and we're the first band to sign with the major label out of the city of Chicago. Well, I I think what's amazing with with this all, Jim, is the fact that I want to go back to talk about, you know, what we would consider a challenge. You were born with a congenital deformity and you were born that way. And here I can show you. (laughs) Yeah. And and all the fingers, all the fingers are in there. They just never grew out. (laughs) And, And I don't have a major peck on my chest here but but that's relatively you know it's not totally uncommon i think it's called poland syndrome like the country poland mm-hmm. and uh, it just air oxygen didn't get to the my major peck and so all the all the muscles all the fingers are in there you should see you see you want to see a weird x-ray they're all in there but they never grew out so a major aspect of, of your success is that you didn't see that as a disability or a challenge. That's the way you were. And you were, it's always been that way. Not, not much unlike some of these soldiers that have challenges where they, they lose, a, a, you know, a, a, an amputee, they lose an arm or leg. That's a whole other way of adapting. You just kind of accepted this that, listen, this is how it is. This is how it's going to be. Done. You don't miss what you never had. Mm-hmm. And I never had it, thank goodness. You know, I went out for the, the diving team in high school and made it on our first state meet team. I picked up conga drums in the 60s, and now I have a whole collection of them, all wooden gong bop skins, you know, and wooden timbales. And then when I was 52, I took up golf. The big production company in town called me and said, we want you to play in our first outing, Jam Productions, Jam Productions in Chicago. 
And they said, we'd like you to play in our first outing. I said, well, I, I don't play golf. And she goes, well, what's your handicap? I said, I got one hand. And she goes, <laughs> she goes, no, no, really. I mean, what's your handicap? And I said, I got one hand. <laughs> and I always assumed, even though my whole family were golfers, I always assumed it was a two-handed sport. And she goes, well, you want to meet Ernie Banks, who's the baseball player for the Cubs, if you know, uh, Hall of Famer. And I go, I'm there. And so I went there, and four months later, I had a hole-in-one. And two weeks after that, I had another hole-in-one. So, and now I've had four. Jim, I, I love your story because, I mean, this, this is such a story of, of overcoming how we perceive things. Mm -hmm. and, and not perceiving them in a negative way, but always a positive way that I can do it as opposed to I cannot. And you seem like you've embraced that and you've just lived with that. Well, like I said, you don't miss what you never had. So you just, you find your own way. I remember uh, listening to uh, Santana the first time and God, how does he do it? How do the drummers do that? Little did I know that there's like three conga drummers and a timbali player and a, and Mike Shreve playing, <laughs> playing traps, you know, a 16 year old kid, you know, and I'm going, how do they, do, how does that drummer do it? You know, and then I break it all down. I go, I can do this part. <laughs> when they say ignorance is bliss, isn't it the truth? An example of it. <laughs> isn't it the truth? Right. So for Novel is that turned into The Crying Shames. How did that name come about, The Crying Shames? Well, you had to see us, first of all. We were, <laughs> we were what grunge band, way before grunge bands were hip. When the Rolling Stones first played in Chicago, we got tickets to go, and we had a contest in the band to see who could be the grubbiest guy to go to that kind. It was a, you know, 3,000-seater 3, Eric Crown Theater the Rolling Stones first time ever here and uh, we were so bad that the bass player had pants that had battery acid dripped all over them you know now the, now they sell them like that but <laughs> back then your mom would my mom would go are you kidding me you wear that and so we we're sitting around our managers told us you have to change your name you know the travelers just isn't hip you know at all so we're sitting around and I, uh, apparently I said, you're such a crying shames. You guys are stinky, <laughs> you know? And, and the manager, yeah, that's a great name. We'll use it. We'll make an A out of it, C-R-Y-A-N, you know, because Moby Grape, all these, <laughs> these weird names coming out. And, uh, yeah, and that's basically how it is. And, <laughs> So how did how were you able to get the band to sign with Columbia Records, which was the first band in the Chicago area, to sign with a major label? How did that come all about? Well, first we we had to get a record out, and and our, these managers, MG Productions, Monaco and Golden, they um, this disc jockey introduced us to them. And they said that they have uh, a lot of the radio in their pocket. You know, they can get things done. We have to get a record out. And do you, do you have a record? And we go, uh, no. But we, we were just, at that time, just starting to write our own material. Somebody turned us on to this new album by the Beatles. It was in England. And we found George Harrison's tune, If I Needed Someone. And we loved it. And it was a great tune. So we recorded it one night boom 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 knock it out and, they, and then the next day they, the managers called they said we tried to get publishing on it and they said that since they hadn't released the album in the united states we couldn't put out the song so he said but i got everybody primed all the the disc jockeys want to hear your songs so uh, we immediately went out that night and partied and went to uh a place called the Coffee Break or something, the CB. And there was a band called the Riddles. And they were playing this weird little fun tune. And so we stole it. And uh, it, it was put out by um, searchers in England. And they found this, this record. And our lead guitarist, Jim Ferris, 
took it and changed a few chords and the things and our lead singer changed the melody a little bit. And then they, they did a chord change going down instead of up at the end. And, you know, and within a week it was on the radio. Next thing you know, it was a big hit in Chicago in the Midwest. And this was the song Sugar and Spice. Sugar and Spice. We started playing now a lot more shows and a lot more teen centers. So they said, let's record an album. There's a lot of uh, talk going. It's a four track mono. Unbelievable. The whole album was four track mono, done at night in full songs, you know, standing around microphones, doing that. And Columbia bought the whole album. The way it was, they, they reproduced in stereo. <laughs> oh, was that. on the first album cover. Well, eventually, after we got an album out, I had a two and a half pound hook, barbed hook, that was hanging at the Hard Rock Cafe in Chicago. And it was two and a half, made by the Art Institute professor, the metal, metallurgy professor, <laughs> and built for me on a sleeve that comes down here, and it was razor sharp. And the guy that made it was the uh, was the guy that made all of David Crosby's capes. If you look, go back and look at the Birds albums, the original Birds albums, David Crosby always had a leather cape yeah. and it was made by John Brown's Leather Works in Old Town, Chicago. And I hung out there rather than go to college. I, I mean, I was supposed to be going to college. <laughs> I'd just go down there and hang with him. And one day I came in and he said, look at this. He puts this thing on my arm and he goes, now we're going around showing it to everybody, you know? And, and so that got to be our, if you look at the front of our first album, Sugar and Spice album, you'll see this big old hook. It's like, we put it, I put it in my forehead. He, I put it in everybody in the band bloody <laughs> at one point or another it, it, over the years. The thing that kept us going was the quality of the music and, and, and the energy of our shows, you know, it's like it all, it was like the perfect storm, you know, it all came together. Boy, when you say the perfect storm, it, people have to understand too, the sign of the times, at that time, all the bands that were performing, all the different acts that were happening, all the touring going on, the amount of music that people were listening to, there was such an exciting time. During 65, those 1965. You're starting to really tour now at this point, right? Yeah, four hundred dollars a night to drive up to Minnesota with the sugar and spice, you know. And you know, this doesn't seem like we got a hit record. It was crazy, but you know what? It beat going to college, and <laughs> and you met a lot of girls, and and, and you felt like the Beatles. Yeah. So it was a strange time, but it was a wonderful time, and there was a lot of competition between. All of a sudden, bands started popping up. And we'd all have our home club, team club. Yeah. Ours was the Blue Village, the Shadows of Night, you know, with Gloria, G L O R. They played at a place called the um, Cellar up in Arlington Heights. I saw the Who there at this team club. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> it was it was the, ba the basement of the telephone company in Arlington Heights, Illinois. <laughs> And the who play there, and so did Eric Clapton, and um, at the Aragon Ballroom, which is still or the puke. I call it the puke palace because. <laughs> it's, uh, but I saw Janis Joplin and got to go backstage with her. You know, hey boy, you want to hit on this other comfort? <laughs> no, you scare me. <laughs> she, she was a wild. She, big Brother couldn't even get tuned, but. <laughs> Uh, and it was, you know, and, and we play a show with Jimi Hendrix well, and, and, and I mean, the Monkees. Were you realizing at the time, like even with Janis Joplin and, 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 and these experiences, did you realize at the time, you know, that these people were legends at what they did and, and, and they were... You no, know, they, 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 I realized there was something special going on. Hmm. You know, like Jimi Hendrix, to me, I wasn't a guitarist, obviously. He just played too loud. He was with Soft Machine at the University of Downtown. And, as, and Jimi Hendrix experience and the opening act was Soft Machine. And the thing that I remember about them was their drummer played in underpants. That's it. 
That's it. That's what I remember about them. And, and Hendrix got up on stage and he said, there's a buzz in my app. And I'm thinking to myself, you play so damn loud. How could anybody hear the buzz anyway? He said, so I'm not going to play. And it was the start of two shows. And, and we had to play for the crowd coming in. <laughs> they didn't know he wasn't, he's gone. <laughs> you know, he left. Yeah. So, so, and then I saw him later again at the amphitheater yeah. but, and he was still loud, but <laughs> what, can I say? what can I say? So then you went on and, and, and you, uh, you were involved with, you know, on the stage with the monkeys. You, you opened up for them. Was that a part of it too? Yeah, we opened with them, but that was, you remember Jimi Hendrix toured with the monkeys for a short time until they realized that this doesn't work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And uh, we did a, a revolving stage once with the monkeys and they had their band behind the curtain, you know, and they were out there lip, kind of lip singing it and everything. This is in, in stadiums. This is when we started doing some things for Columbia. We were lucky enough to play at the Auditorium Theater in Chicago with Procol Harum and um, Rotary Connection. Jefferson Airplane also? We did a we did a TV show with Jefferson Air, Airplane where they opened for us. <laughs> if you can believe that, Gracie Slick in her little go-go boots and yeah. you know Columbia had no idea what to do with us. You got a guy with a two and a half pounds barbed hook that looks like something Moby Dick would have in his, <laughs> jaw, you know, and, and and they had trouble promoting it. They they put us out on on what they called promo tours where you take your guitars just the guitars and you fly to a city and you'd go see the disc jockeys and talk on the air or they, you'd go to one of their sock hops or you'd go to one of their little tv shows and you'd lip sing we got to a point where i would be playing bass with my <laughs> hook yeah you know because nothing's coming out of it it's just on the screen and that was just so exciting well, what an amazing time and what an exciting feeling to experience that. So then you move to California and you get involved in a different business. You open up a restaurant. Well, that was a, two albums later. And but um, yeah, um, there's one thing that I would tell all your striving musicians. Keep practicing. Keep doing what you're doing, but get another job just in case. It wasn't like we were making a lot of money. I mean, the guys that came after us in, in the Midwest, at least, Ario Speedwagon and, and those guys, you know, they're all of a sudden playing big barns and making 50 grand a night. You know, we're making three, you know, if we're lucky in playing teen centers. The lesson is totally to understand and be involved, read the contracts and stay on top of the business side of it so so you don't get you know, uh, misdirected and, 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 and taken advantage of, which is a huge lesson that, that you learned at, at, at that part of it. So now, after you started the, the restaurant business in LA, you moved back to Chicago. Actually, I was in the restaurant business in Chicago and where I learned how to make deep dish pizzas right. and stuff. And then I went out to California uh, after the band broke up. My good friend that got me started with the Travelers he is, had taken over uh, a booking agencies in, in California. He didn't take them over, but he, he ended up making an agent, agency uh, out of uh, he and his partner, Danny Weiner. This is Fred Bolander, who is in, in uh, Monterey Peninsula Artists. Have you ever heard of them? Yes, well, yeah. He owned it. And... Um, just got, I think he just retired a year or two ago. I haven't talked to him in a while and I miss him. Got to find him. Um, and they booked everybody. And then Perdigium, Perdigium bought them and uh, made them billionaires. And uh, then they hired him back because they realized that modern music doesn't make as much money as old music. <laughs> and and he had Huey Lewis and Bonnie Raitt and everybody you know in their pocket and uh, and he's just the most honest and best guy and he calls me one day and says hey i got some guys that are want to open a restaurant in marina del rey would you come down and help them start it get it going these guys had no clue 
they're from the Walgreen family of, you know, they had no clue, but they said, we have uh, the most secret recipe for pizza. You know, come on down. And, and I was living in San Francisco at the time, or Berkeley, actually. And I came down to L.A. and started it with them. And then they all just bought cars and left. So, <laughs> and then I came back and I restarted the group up <laughs> in the 80s. Restarted in 86, and we've been playing ever since. But this is great learning experience that, that you went through, and this helped you out, I'm sure, in many other avenues in your life. So now talk about the cornerstones of rock and what you're doing with that. That started as a, uh, a PBS um, uh, show, television show, special, that they would, uh, PBS would go out and get, you know, pledges. It entailed um, the Ides of March, Jim Peterick, who wrote um, Eye of the Tiger yes, absolutely. and Vehicle and um, uh, the Buckinghams, kind of a drag, you know, all the Susan and all those songs. And um, then Shadows of Night, lead singer Jimmy Sands, uh, lead singers from uh, New Colony Six, which was another Chicago act that was very well liked back in the 60s. And so we did this show and it was very well liked and everything. And so now we're, we're out doing shows, you know, in, in theaters with the same kind of thing. The Buckinghams do a set and we do like uh, four or five songs, six songs. You know, it's sort of like the Happy Together tour that the Turtles kept with Absolutely. one band or two bands. Absolutely. And so this, this happened just before the pandemic. You were still pretty active doing some shows. So yeah, and plus the crying shames were doing their own shows too, but they we're trying not to cross up each each guy. So, but so we were doing that right up to 2019, and then uh, and tell you the truth, they got five booked I think now for this summer. So we'll see. We had five last year booked and they canceled. So we'll see. We started up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Yeah. Ah, sure. Yeah, he and. Um, you know, we, we work all around the Midwest mainly. But what an, an incredible story and what a great, you know, adventure that you have been on and you continue to be on with this crazy music industry that it just keeps going. Yeah. Who, who would have guessed? <laughs> First of all, I don't know too many people that know me very well that knew me back then that thought I'd be alive yeah. today. And, <laughs> I'm, I, and I agree with them. But, uh, and who would think that there's still people out there that really want to see you and hear your music? You know, it's, it always, I'm flattered and flabbergasted at the same time, you know? I can't believe it, you know? But they do, and they like it, and God bless them, because without them, I'd be nowhere. <laughs> there's obviously something, Jim, that you deliver in the music and in just your life story that people can relate to, that they are inspired by, and you have continued to do this, and this is incredible. So now with the pandemic, hopefully coming to a close, I hope to see you back on the road. Jim, yeah. thank you so much. You have been an absolute pleasure, man, on behalf of the Artist Series at a distance. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you real soon. Thank you so much, and thank you. I, I hope I helped you with what your your project is, and, and it's such a pleasure to see you, Dom, all the time. You sure did. Thank you so much, Jim. Take care. Dom Famular here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.